Hi, and welcome to video five. Uh, this is the fifth of five videos for section 1.4. I alluded to it in the end of fourth video. This video is all about the squeeze theorem. So not just theorem one, not theorem two, not theorem three. This has its own specific name known as the squeeze theorem says the following, if f of x is less than or equal to g of x, which is less than or equal to h of x, when x is near a, except possibly at a, And if the limit as x approaches a of f of x, so if that limit is equal to the limit as x approaches a of h of x, and these both equal the same value l, then by the squeeze theorem, the limit of g of x as x approaches a has to be this same guy, L. So think of it maybe like an accordion. So I have some function f over here, some function h over here. Using what we had at the end of uh, video four, if I just have these two, then their limits as x approaches a are going to have this same relationship. This one's less than that. And similarly, along the same idea, if these, I'm looking at just these two, their limits are also going to have this same relation. So if the limit of this one is equal to the limit of that one, and g is either less than or greater than or equal to these other guys, they all have to end up being the same. Why do we use this? Why is this a big deal? Well, sometimes we get a function that is real messy. We can try all the algebra we want. Uh, we can try using all the different limit laws. It just is a big mess. But if we can use the squeeze theorem, if we can find some function that's less than the function we're given, and some function that's bigger than the function that we're given, if we can find the limits on both ends, if they're the same, then we know that the limit of the guy in the middle has to be the same. So let's actually look at an example. Let's say we want to show that the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times sine of 1 over x is equal to 0. All right, so. Uh, direct substitution, can we do it? No, we can't. Why? Because if we plug in 0 for x, that's not in the domain of that function there. So let's try to use the squeeze theorem. So we want to, if we're going to call this guy here, let's call what we were given g of x. So I want to find some function that I can call f of x that if I evaluate it is less than that guy, and I want to find some value that I'll call h of x that if I evaluate it is greater than g of x. So we're going to go back to uh, I want to do this. Okay. So we're going to go back to our basic trigonometry class. So what do we have? We have that sine of 1 over x, I'm uh, sorry, first off, sine of x is what? What's my limits on sine of x? Well, if I draw the graph, that's why this was so important. It's doing what? It's bouncing between negative 1 and 1.
So the reciprocal of that guy, so it's sine of one over x, because what I'm trying to do is build my way up to this g of x function. I have sine of one over x. So sine of one over x has the same domain and range, negative one to one. Because if I flip this guy over, it still looks dissimilar, it's just upside down, right? Now, since, so again, what, I wanted, what I'm trying to do is build up this middle piece to look like this. So I have sine of 1 over x. I'm missing the x squared. Since x squared is always greater than or equal to 0, why is that important? Well, if this was just an x, I'd be in trouble, right? Because sometimes x would be negative, and if I multiply this whole thing by a negative value, what happens? The inequalities have to reverse direction. But because x squared is always positive, if I have negative 3 and I square it, it's positive 9. If I have 2 and I square it, it's positive 4. It's always going to be greater than or equal to 0. So I can multiply this whole thing by a positive number, and it's not going to affect the inequalities. So if I multiply the whole row here by x squared, what do I get? I get minus x squared is less than or equal to x squared sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to x squared. So I multiply x squared by this, x squared by this one, x squared by that one. And I get, now what? Three functions set up as an inequality where f of x is less than g of x is less than h of x. So let's call this guy then f of x. We already said from up above, g of x is this guy. And so we'll call the piece at the end, the positive x squared is my h of x. So now by squeeze theorem, if the limit of f of x is the same as the limit of h of x, then that means that has to be the limit of g of x. If this value is greater than or equal to that one and less than or equal to that one, but these two are the same, it has to be equal. So let's do that. Let's find f of x first, the limit. And what are we going to here as x goes to 0? So the limit as x goes to 0 of f of x is the limit as x goes to 0 of negative x squared, so that's in the domain, so I can do direct substitution. So that's just what? That's just 0. Probably should have used green there, sorry. So that was my green one, my f of x. And blue for h of x, if I'm finding the limit of h of x as x goes to 0, that's the limit as x goes to 0 of positive x squared, which is also 0. So by the squeeze theorem, if the limit of f of x as x goes to 0 is 0, is equal to the limit of h of x as x goes to 0, which is 0, that means the limit as x goes to 0 of g of x has to be 0. So there we go. That's how we can use the squeeze theorem to find the limit of a function that otherwise might be pretty messy. But if we can find two functions on either side of it and then find those limits, if they end up being the same thing, it kind of does the work for us. <coughs> so we have a special limit here. Actually, I'm going to write this in red. That's how important it is. You're going to want to have this somewhere handy throughout the semester because you'll use this regularly. You have the limit as x goes to 0 of the sine of theta over theta is equal to 1. And the proof of this is on page 42. 
So for example, IE, if I have the limit, as x goes to zero of sine of three over three, so these two values in the numerator and the denominator have to be the same. So sine of three over three is equal to one. So really powerful property that we have there. We have sine of theta over theta, it's limit as x goes, or I suppose that's theta, huh? Yeah, so this should be theta. So as theta goes to zero, ah, no, it is x, I'm sorry, it's x. So as x goes to zero, the sine of theta over theta is equal to one. Okay. So let's look at one more example. That'll wrap up the videos for section 1.4. So let's find the limit as x goes to zero of sine of seven x over four x. <clears throat> so we can't just use this guy here that I just showed you. But if somehow So if somehow I can rewrite this to have that form, then I know that piece just goes to one. So I'm gonna have to apply some algebra because I can't really change what's inside here, the seven X. But if somehow I can get a seven X in the denominator, then I can apply this property here. So I'm gonna to need to use some algebra. So the limit as X goes to zero of sine of seven X over 4x. So if I want to get a 7x in the denominator here, what do I need to do? Well, I'm going to need to get rid of this 4. So if I multiply this whole thing by a 4 in the numerator, then that means these 4s would cancel out, but I would just have an x in the denominator, right? So if I multiply a 7 here, if I multiply this whole thing across, well, this 4 cancels with that one, 7 times x, so this whole thing really becomes what? It becomes the limit as x approaches 0. So again, multiply all this across, you get 7 sine of 7x over 7x times, ah, so let me fix something here. This is actually, so I want sine of x over 7x. That's what I really want. But, I, that's not what I started with. I started with the 4x here. This is what I want. This is what I was given. So to get to this, what do I have to do? So the opposite of what I just showed you. I have to multiply a 7 here so these cancel and a 4. Now, if I multiply this thing through, it gets me back to the original. So remember, we always can use that as a check that if I just do the math that I just wrote into the problem, it should give me what I started with. So sorry for the confusion there. I want sine of 7x over 7x so I can apply this property. And the only way to do that is if I multiply by 7 over 4. That way the 7s cancel, multiply through, gives me 4x in the denominator, which is what I started. So hopefully I didn't confuse you too much there. Uh, kind of cleared it up, I hope. So, All right, so now using one of our limit laws, because I have this product, I can split them apart. The limit as x goes to zero of this guy times the limit as x goes to zero of seven over four. So now using this property, the limit as x goes to zero 
of sine of 7x over 7x, so this whole thing is just equal to 1, times, well, the limit as x goes to 0 of some constant is just that constant, 7 over 4. So that means 1 times 7 over 4 means that this original limit just goes to 7 fourths. So again, sorry for the algebra confusion there. Hopefully it makes sense. You can kind of rewind if you need to to where I sort of corrected it and uh, follow through from there. But anyways, that ends the videos for section 1.4. Uh, come on back and we'll tackle section 1.5.